Well, welcome to the Ignite stage at the World Economic Forum for a special conversation with music legend and cultural icon, Nile Rogers, one of the recipients of this year's Crystal Awards, celebrating the achievements of leading artists who are bridge builders and role models for all leaders of society. And frankly, Folks, I couldn't be more excited about being on this stage, feeling slightly in awe uh, of my a very special guest today, Lafrique. Good times, we are family. I'm coming out, I'm coming out. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's dance and like a virgin. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. Just a few of the hits that uh, Niall has written and produced, making an indelible mark on our lives. And I think everybody in this room and everybody watching will agree with me they're impacting not only our musical tastes but also our cultural upbringing. Niall receives this award for his efforts to make the world a more peaceful, equal and inclusive place through his music uh, and also through that his commitment to fighting systemic racism, inequality and injustice and by um, basically you know, bringing in innovative youth voices. A motivation to simply do good that has driven Niall to becoming a formidable force in philanthropy, his commitment to making the world a better place through his We Are Family Foundation is a testament to his character and the enduring legacy uh, that he is building beyond the stage and studio. Now, Rogers, congratulations. 71 young and still winning awards. How does it feel, mate? Um, pretty overwhelming. <laughs> it's, it's exciting, though. Um, I'll be the first one to say that I never took on um, this job um, as a musician to win awards. Believe it or not, all I wanted to do was get one hit record. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I guess that, <laughs> that plan history. didn't work. <laughs> well, that was when uh, that was when you were. I think your first job was as a musician on Sesame Street. Am I yes. right in saying that? Yes, that's right. So it was back in the day that you thought if I get one hit record off the back of that, then uh, then you'll be made. Well, listen, you know, only recently you, you've just won a Grammy, you've won a Lifetime Achievement Award, you're in the you're in the Hall of Fame. I mean, it is it is a remarkable remarkable journey and I want to talk about that journey today. You were born and raised in New York, uh, socialized from a, a young age to care about other people and in the words of your late mum, to treat others the way you wanted to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. Just talk about your upbringing, um, you joining the Black Panther Party, your grassroots efforts in Manhattan. Talk about how that upbringing shaped who you are today. Well. I'm going to try and make it quick because normally I go on and on. <laughs> so I, um, I, I, I had a, a wonderful childhood, even though my parents uh, were both heroin addicts. Um, but they were incredibly loving. They were bohemian to the hilt. So they were immersed in the culture of the time. And that was a very culturally rich period. Um, on any given day, I could come to my, come home to my apartment and find Thelonious Monk or Nina Simone, Miles Davis, um, just all the cool people um, in the music business. Um, so, just, just living in that environment, having those type of brains and that kind of love and that kind of spirit around you. Um, you just sort of take that out into the world with you. So uh, back in those days, you know, she said, I'm 71, oh, ouch, but yeah. <laughs> I said 71 young, you heard me say okay, that. Okay, okay. <laughs> but the point is, is that if, you know, if you picture what the world was like when I was five, six, seven years old, um, uh, technology was, it was almost primitive compared to the way we live now. Um, so uh, back in those days, I found myself helping a lot of people um, who were on crutches and who were blind, people in wheelchairs who couldn't, re you know, the society, well, New York City, we didn't even have the, the nice 
divot the scoops there so that you can let the wheelchair down easily. We had to like, you know, rock them back. And I'm a little skinny kid, mm. but, but I did it all the time. And that was, that was my kind of life. So I was always involved with, um, you know, uh, either remedial education programs that would help me, or I was working at soup kitchens. I learned how to make pickles from Gus the Pickle King. Um, I would sweep up the floor. I'd sweep up the, the ground in front of his store. Um, so it was just an amazing childhood. And you said you had a music bed, you know, as, as part of that upbringing, of these incredible characters. Just how much, how important was music to you? It was everything. Mm. I, um, I used to score my life. So if I were walking down the street, you know, um, in my head, I was, you know, I could hear the music, t you know, telling me how this scene plays out. You know? <laughs> so when I finally got a chance to do a film, I was like, I got this. <laughs> I've, I've been doing this all my life. Oh, you know, I, I walk down the street and go, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, it, and it just was crazy like that because there were so many musicians around, so many great artists from many disciplines. So it just seemed like that was my destiny. Mm. I honestly pictured myself at, when I was seven years old, uh, you know, in a symphony orchestra, hoping that it'd be the American Symphony um, or the New York Philharmonic, I just could see myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I was, I mean, imagine you're seven years old, dreaming that you're gonna sit first chair. You know, it was <laughs> like, it was, but. Well, Lily, I wanna talk about the music clearly. I know the, 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 this is a room full of people who, you know, I've, a number of people have come up before we started and just sort of, you know, shown how in awe they are of you. And I, I know the music's so important. We, we'll talk about that. I wanna talk about the foundation as well, because you have put youth, um, at the very heart of the work that you do. I'm a TV person, and so I do things in, 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 in moving pictures. And so with the help of your team, we were able to put together a little video with some of the people who I know have a special place in your heart. Take a look at this. I am a youth delegate with the We Are Family Foundation. I'm proud to be part of this family started by Nile Rogers. I'm absolutely thrilled that the World Economic Forum is honoring Nile with the Crystal Award. It's important to be part of such convenings and have a seat and have a say. You need young people in these rooms because you cannot alienate people from their own decision making. We're not just doing work now for this decade. We're doing work now for the next century. The value which young people bring is they bring energy, passion and drive. These things should be passed on, not just through dialogue, but also action. Helping young leaders or having them in decision-making spaces isn't just the smart thing to do, it's the urgent thing to do. We're here and we're going to be here for a long time. We actually want to participate and shape the agenda. Organizations and nonprofits in every sector cannot afford to miss out on this vital voice. That is you know who that is. <laughs> That's just, uh, folks, a selection of the amazing young leaders who are here in Davos, thanks to you, Niall, and the We Are Family Foundation. How does that make you feel, watching that? Um, I, you know, I love them. I'm so touched. Just to give you an example of how incredible they are and the work that they do, um, one of those gentlemen when first came to us uh, when he was 15 years old. His village was flooded for the first time in history. And they had never seen anything like that. I mean, imagine, you know, uh, you have your way of life. And he was from the north of England. And um, I guess they were, it's a, either a farming community mm. or whatever. But it, what, it, the crop was lost for the year. And he was like, wow, how did that happen? And they said, um, well, you know, this is what's going to happen now due to climate change. Mm -hmm. And he went, climate change? Like, what is that? <laughs> um, they were saying, yeah, the temperature of the planet is changing. So, um, you know, we can expect more floods and erratic weather. And he said, well, why aren't they teaching us about this in school? Mm -hmm. So, because school is to prepare you for the rest of your life, right? That's why you go to school. Mm -hmm. um, and he was 
he just couldn't understand why they weren't teaching it. So he went down to 10 Downing Street, knocked on the door, and eventually he, he was going to see the prime minister. He, he was that driven. Um, uh, he didn't see the prime minister that day, but uh, whomever he met with was quite taken with this young 15-year-old. Um, and they listened, and eventually he did get to see the prime minister. Mm. And they added um, climate change to the UK curriculum. And, mm. and, and now he's in the UK government. Well, <laughs> well, that prime minister, as was, who is now the foreign minister, is here, David Cameron. That would have been David Cameron right. back in 2015. That's a, that's a remarkable story. And just testament to the, to the work that you do with We Are Family. Um, the foundation, of course, takes its name from the 1979 song you wrote and produced for Sister Sledge, um, alongside your musical partner, Bernie Edwards. And that song seems to encapsulate the duality of your legacy, um, a hit song that we all know and, dare I say, have sung <laughs> on various stages around the world in karaoke, but one that also uh, speaks volumes to your belief of the power that music um, can make um, and change in people's lives. Let's talk about that relationship that you had with your musical partner, Bernard Edwards. Yeah, well, Bernard was so interesting because if there were two people that were drastically unalike, bingo, <laughs> Nal Rogers and Bernard Edwards. We were so different. He, by the time we met, I guess I was about 18 or 19, Bernard had already had three or four kids. I was like, whoa, what are you, what? <laughs> yeah, like, what's happening here? <laughs> he had a day job, like, wow, a real paycheck every day? That's cool. Um, and I was a, a sort of hippie, you know, just guitar player for hire. And um, I, I did work every day, too, but I didn't know who I was going to be working with every day. Mm. I'd open my um, daily planner and it would say, go to this studio at this hour, go to this studio here. And uh, Bernard and I, from the first moment we met, we were on one of those jobs where nobody knew each other, mm. right? The, the band leader just uh, looked in his book and said, oh, this guy plays piano, this guy plays bass, this guy plays mm. guitar. So the guy who played guitar was not me. The guy who he had hired was a great friend of mine. Mm. The great friend got a job paying more money, so he gave me this cheaper ah, job. Perfect. Thank God. <laughs> had he not given me that cheaper job, I would have never met Bernard. Well. Bernard changed my life. He, um, he taught me a style of guitar playing that I didn't really understand. I mean, I had heard it on a lot of records, but it wasn't something that excited me. Um, and anyway, to try and make a long story just a little longer, um, <laughs> uh, we were we were with this group called New York City, and we got a hope we we got a, a hit record in uh, 1973 called "I'm Doing Fine Now." Mm -hmm. I'm doing fine now. How do, 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 without you, baby. So we got a hit record, nice. and it was happening. <laughs> we traveled around the world, and we got an opening spot for the Jackson Five, and they were going to do their first world tour but they started it in America. So we did the American leg, and anyway, long story, I'm trying to make it short. <laughs> I'll wind but you up anyway, that on that tour, um, we also were doing our own shows, and we played a, a club in Miami Beach, and this kid had to borrow my amplifier because we didn't have enough time to change over in a, in a nightclub in a bar. And all of a sudden, he's playing through my gear, and he sounds 10 times better than me. <laughs> and, and it was because of the kind of guitar he was playing and the style mm. of guitar that he was playing. And that's what Bernard had been trying to convince me to do. Wow. So while they were playing sounding fantastic, and we were playing sounding OK, Bernard was just staring at me like, looks, looks could kill. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to tell you all these months. Man. So right after that, I went out and bought a Stratocaster, which is now called the Hitmaker, because that guitar has played on 
uh, hundreds of thousands. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know. I mean, because I still like to work all the time. Yeah. And, um, uh, and that's the main guitar and, I play. And, and you continue, <laughs> and, and, and the work, you know, the work is, continues to be as fantastic as it, as it has always been. You've been a pioneer in disco. You contributed to the foundation of hip hop. Your Grammy award winning collaborations with artists like Duff, uh, De Def Punk and, and, um, and Beyonce, they continue to shape uh, today's music landscape. If you had a favorite to pick, which would it be? People ask me that question, <laughs> knowing that you can't answer it. <laughs> there, there is, this is like, I, I, if I said that, I'd right away say to myself, "What am I saying? That's I'm, I'm lying to the, I'm lying to her." What did you enjoy producing, writing, and producing most? Probably my first song mm. uh, called "Everybody Dance" because. I didn't know that I was a producer. I thought that I just was the guy who wrote the composer. Um, and then, because I did all the arrangements, everybody was looking to me for notes. So they would say, uh, hey now, uh, at letter A, do we just do bam? And I would say, well, yeah, let's try that. But, you know, I have it written in, but we may not want to use it. We may want to actually just let the bass take it. And then the string players would ask me something else. Mm -hmm. The horn players would ask me something else. The guy playing the vibraphones would ask me. So I kept saying to Bernard, why is everybody looking at me? The guy who paid for the studio, they should be asking him. And then the guy who paid for the studio looked at me and started asking me questions. He said, well, now you're the producer. I went, oh, really? Okay. Well. <laughs> so from that first record, that, yeah. I, that first song that I wrote for Chic, Everybody Dance, I was a producer. I didn't know it, but I was. Mm -hmm. And I've produced ever since. How many have you produced? What's the volume oh, of the work? Do you know? On. No, it, it, no. Yeah, <laughs> you no. got no idea. No, no. Yeah, I, you have to. If if, if I say it, I it, I know it's a lie. Mm. If I if I said, you know, oh, I've played five hundred tracks. I know it's a lie. Mm. I, I I can't. I you know it's it's ridiculous. Let and, you know. It's, it's like when, 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 when you want facts, when you want absolute facts right down to the number, I have to read them because <laughs> I honestly, no I can't, Why would I you can't remember. Why would you know? And it doesn't matter. Let's talk to another young person. And we've, we've heard from, from some here. 16 year old Nile Rogers. 16 year old Nile Rogers. He writes most of what will later become a hit song uh, we Are Family at Woodstock, and he joins the Black Panther Party in that year. Yeah. Sitting here today, what would you tell him if you could speak to him today? Do everything exactly the way you did it. Mm. Because it all somehow worked. If you looked at it on paper as a, a, a schematic mm. as to how your life should be wired, it would be completely wrong. Nothing would make sense. The only thing that really made sense was drive and determination, which is why um, our foundation, we are Family Foundation, uh, backs youths the way we do, because that drive and de determination is something that is, it's a power and a force to be reckoned with. Even though I was a skinny little kid, my heart, was in such a good place and I guess my training and my technique my intellect whatever at that time when I was 16 years old I knew that I wanted to do music I knew that I wanted to help the community I wanted to join the organization that was that at that time seemed like the most effective so when I joined the Black Panther Party this was I mean you have no idea how amazing it was for my life because the Black Panther Party taught us about business. They taught us how to run a business, mm -hmm. which most people don't know. They think of the Black Panthers walking around with guns and <laughs> fighting cops. Well, that's like 
two or three days that mm -hmm. that happened, four or five, you know, at, basically we'd get up in the morning and we'd go to the different vendors in our community. And because we understood business, we understood how their shops worked, we would be able to approach them in a way that was beneficial to their business, beneficial to the community, mm -hmm. just with dollars and cents. We would mm -hmm. say, hey, if you donate it to us, after a while, you'll be able to take a tax write-off, um, and you also won't have to s pay for factory seconds going back, mm -hmm. so you actually are doing good on two levels. Mm -hmm. You're financially doing good for yourself, but look what you're doing for the community. And we're going to go around and tell everybody what a great job you're doing. We're going to tell the children that we're feeding, hey, guess what? Today's breakfast um, is due to mm. this particular vendor and this guy and, and Pablo. Everybody knows Pablo. We call him Pablito. We go, you know, he's the man. He gave us the bread. He gave us the sweet potatoes. He gave us the eggs, you know, and, and, and that spirit at 16 was already in me because at six that spirit was in me that spirit is in you today what's next what are you well, doing what, what's, let, what's coming up so let me you know when you ask me for statistics and numbers like i said like i couldn't have, I, I honestly cannot tell you yeah. we have to look up go to wikipedia and it'll say <laughs> oh now rogers is just, you know he's done this <laughs> It's true. Come on, Anjali. I, I mean, I, we, we've played together, God knows how many, in the most unusual situations. Mm. You know, like, oh, well, yeah, when we were in Switzerland, we went to this little yeah. place and played. Yeah, no, but remember we did the thing with John McLaughlin. Yeah. Yeah. We should have you up on See, the stage. She doesn't even, she doesn't even remember. <laughs> what have you got on your list? What have you, before I All right, wait a minute. audience. So, so what we're doing now, uh, so we're, the reason why we're here and the reason why we have nine delegates from We Are Family Foundation. For over 20 years, We Are Family Foundation has worked with the, and mentored some of the most incredible young people who are solving global issues. Now we want them to take a seat at decision-making tables. We Are Family study name. We call it the collaboration across generations. Now let me show you what we did with this study. We went to the University of Vienna. We had, we, we surveyed over a thousand people from 100 countries. Um, the median age was 31 years old, but they ranged in age from 17 to 74, wow. from 57 different industries. Here were, the, here were the findings of this study. Most people believe intergenerational collaboration is of great value. Look at me at 17 with Sesame Street. I mean, mm. they probably paid me less, but <laughs> it, it was de I was definitely great value to Sesame Street. Mm. Um, uh, most people believe that youth have powerful ideas and solutions to global problems. And I believe that with all my heart and soul because I've always been around young people doing that. I used to be one of them, and those people have continued to be my friends mm -hmm. for my whole life. And as they got older, they still were doing incredible things mm -hmm. for people. Um, and the last point in this survey was... Um, most believe organizations do not empower young people to contribute to those ideas. And this is the problem. I mean, I love the fact that this, this year's uh, motto, if you will, is um, rebuilding trust. So why do people not want young people at the decision-making table? Honestly, I think that they just don't trust I'm, I mean, I'm going to say us now. I'm going to say, because I was one of those young people. They didn't believe that I could write for the New York Philharmonic. They didn't believe that a person like me could, could take on adult-like responsibilities. Uh, I don't think that uh, it was because they would think I was taking their jobs or anything like that. I just think that they didn't believe that I was 
proficient enough. They didn't believe that I had the, the technical facility or the knowledge, but I, in fact, did. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a great example for other kids like me to, to say, oh, on every Monday night, the New York Philharmonic is going to have a young conductor who's 17 years, you know, between the ages of 17 and 25 or something like that. Matter of fact, I'm going to suggest that. That's a great idea. I'm going to go out. That, you heard it first here. Yeah. <laughs> that I, mean, I just made that up on the spot, but I mean, how okay. cool would that be? Yeah. No, and, and, you know, all credit to you, mate. I mean, uh, the work you're doing with the foundation is amazing. Um, you listen to those youngsters, um, you know, it, it, you're changing lives. Um, and you know, it is, you know, we applaud you for that. Before we close this out, because we've only got five minutes left, anybody in the audience with a question? Oh, oh come, come on. on. Come on, He loves a question. He's going to say, when can you play my next part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep fit at 71? Uh, Good. I work like crazy, and I eat um, very, very healthy. I, you know, I... I watch my diet. I, look, um, it's not a secret, but I used to have a big problem with drugs and alcohol. And uh, at 38 years old, I got diabetes. And ever since then, I had to control, um, you know, the effects of diabetes with um, what I consumed. And, um, and I've been pretty good at it, you know? And also, you know, it keeps me slim, and I look cool on stage. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I model for Chanel, which is only women's clothing. <laughs> but, you know, I fit into the women's clothing. So, and they just renewed my contract. So, yeah. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I love it again. Yes, sir. Keep doing what you do. Yeah, <laughs> Thank absolutely. you. Um, Please. So, there's lots of powerful people here at Davos, um, and there's a lot of uh, politicians here as well. Uh, and business leaders, and they're often trained in, you know, uh, how to speak in front of an audience, how to captivate people. They would give their right arm to be able to do to an audience what you do naturally. Oh. And if you could speak to all those business leaders and political leaders, what is it that you know that they don't know? Because you haven't been trained to do that. It comes from your heart. There's an extraordinary sort of positivity that radiates that's infectious from you it's beautiful what is it that you know that they don't know great question you know what i always just tell the truth that's all i do the reason why it's so easy for me to talk um <laughs> and i often talk too much uh, is because i just tell the truth um so if i were representing uh, a product so to speak, you know, I play a Fender guitar. I would never tell somebody to buy something that's substandard or something that I didn't believe in um, uh, just because they're paying me or because they're saying, you know, whatever. Um, uh, everything that I do with Chanel is something that I love. I mean, they, they don't dress me. They ask me what I want to wear, which is, to me, is like, I mean, can you imagine mm -hmm. a fashion house like Chanel asking you, uh, no, what would you, what do you think is cool? Uh, I think, that's cool, Virginia, <laughs> and that's cool. And you know what, if you make me a suit out of that, I think it's really cool. Is and that they, what you do? do? Is that, that what you do? That, that's exactly what I do. I mean, and, and it's, it's the same, and I think that Everybody's life, and I truly believe this, everybody's life is interesting. Sometimes you just have to dig deep and share the things that you normally feel afraid to share, but being able to share those truths mm. are powerful because um, it's, it's what the way, us, right? well, that's the way that I stop drinking and drugging, is just being in rooms sharing truth people telling me their stories and you know the first night I met David Bowie um, and he told me that he was sober 
And I'm like, well, I've, I've heard these wild stories about you, blah, blah, blah. He said, that was then now, nah, darling. This is now. <laughs> and, and it was like he was just so open with me. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time I went to an AA meeting, I said, the loudest voice I ever heard when it came to me getting sober was uh, Eric Clapton's silence because he knew that when I was that drunk and high, I couldn't hear him. So he never even said one word to me. All he did was show me every day, show me what to do, show me what to do. And eventually, boing, I got it. Eric Clapton, we're closing it out with Eric Clapton. Now, Rogers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.